so we're actually starting on time. Uh, this is a, a measure of our guest's uh, how, presentism. presentism, having him present, um, and having a, a large room full of people who want to have a chance to talk with them and, and to hear him. Um, our, our guest today is Douglas Rushkoff, of course. Um, this is a Berkman lunch. Uh, my name is David Weinberger. There are a few little housekeeping things, and then we will, we will begin. Um, so first of all, this is being webcast. It will be out on the net in the infinite present, and so anything you say, uh, say whatever you would like, but just be aware that there's no taking it back because it's the internet. Uh, the, uh, there will be books available by Douglas uh, for sale over in this corner. If you are in this room, if you are watching a webcast, then you know how to get books, and you should. Um, and so what we uh, normally, for a, an event that draws fewer people, we like to go around. Everybody says who they are and why they're here. But obviously, we're not going to do that um, uh, this, this afternoon. Um, but if, uh, if you do um, participate, if, if you talk, then it would be helpful if you said your name, if you so choose, and uh, also you know, like two words of attribution. Um, my two words of attribution would be I'm a, um, a senior researcher at the Berkman Center. So something along those lines. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing Douglas, uh, A, because you are here because you already have an idea who he is, and B, because I'm really, really bad at it. He is a writer, an author, and a media theorist, and I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. And we're going to, we're going to uh, rather than having Douglas um, go through a deck of slides, which would be, I've seen you present, it would be fabulous, we figured instead that we would do this um, entirely conversationally, mm -hmm. with the one slight exception of uh, we've agreed that I will ask you a leading question, and then you can expiate for expiate does not mean something. You, I think it means you're going to apologize. Oh. I think it's probably not what I had in mind. I thought it was people who leave your the football. Team <laughs> yeah, PAs. yeah. Um, so you, you will hold forth for a bit about um, yeah. the book or whatever you actually whatever is on your mind. The book, of course. Present Shock, wonderful title, by the way. I love the title. A really interesting book, too, but the title's fantastic. Um, so do you want to tell us what led you to write Present Shock and where it's leading you now? Yeah, it's funny. The, the, the thing that led me to write Present Shock was the same thing that led me to Berkman. I think it was before it was called Berkman. It was called, the, remember the Harvard, Harvard Conference on the Internet and Society? And a bunch of us young bright-eyed, bushy-tailed uh, uh, techno enthusiasts came to do a panel called Techno-Realism, where and Charlie Nesson put up this big slide saying, is techno-realism bullshit? <laughs> and this is the first that we didn't even know if it was bullshit or not. We were just doing it. But the, um, God bless him. Uh, I know his name's been coming up for me a lot lately because of the whole Ellsberg, NSA, WikiLeaks-like. Now, Charlie is one of, just to be clear, is one of the founders of. I know, I know you know. I'm actually speaking to oh. the. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a big Harvard law professor who defended Ellsberg in the Pentagon Papers, and then is the, one of the first founder guys of Berkman, and still teaches here to this day, and does very big internet law things and ideas. Um, but the, what what pushed us. Uh, to develop those ideas is the same thing that pushed me to develop this, only now with 20 years hindsight I can understand what it was uh, that I was, that at least I was really trying to get at. And um, it has to do with balancing kind of uh, techno dystopianism with techno utopianism. Oh, turn this on? Yeah. Oh, for the web. For the web. All right. NSA is in on the rest of this. The NSA doesn't need our stinking microphones. Come on. There's they're already in this room. I'm sure, two of you. <laughs> our NSA bots in human disguise. Um, that was one of the signs. <laughs> <laughs> 
when the net first came around, I saw it as a great boon for slackerdom. And for those of you who weren't around for slackerdom, slacker, we were, we were a people of the early and mid 1980s who wanted to create more time to have fun and read and think. And we didn't want to become yuppie scum, which it looked like everyone was becoming. And the net looked like this great way to create time, right? We were all, in the early visions, we were all going to get to work at home in our underwear in our own time and exchange and transact directly in some kind of an Etsy, Burning Man-like rave of culture and intellect. And something else really happened on the way home from Wired Magazine is that the, the internet instead became the poster child for the dying NASDAQ stock exchange and, as I see it, the dying industrial age economy. So instead of using the net to create more time for people, what we used the net for was to turn human attention into the next commodity. You know, corporate capitalism had expanded through every uh, uh, physical territory of the planet to the point where the planet was kind of fighting back, whether it was uh, geopolitically or environmentally. But human attention seemed to be this tremendous untapped resource because people were only spending maybe eight hours a day working and maybe two hours a day consuming. Couldn't they spend 48 hours a day working and consuming and socializing? So if you broke up people's attention or somehow created four parallel attention tracks and had them running 24 hours a day and had several other ones running automatically, couldn't we mine time, really, for more present? You know, and um, instead of getting this internet, which gave us more time, uh, more time to think, instead of having an internet that worked not like a phone, but like an asynchronous technology that would sit and wait until we were damn well ready to deal with it, you know, instead of having these great asynchronous sequential conferences and topics on places like The Well and other bulletin boards where you would take hours to craft a response to something and sound smarter online than you did in real life, we ended up with a, uh, a digital space where we were uh, constantly being interrupted with emergency pings from, you know, someone changing their Facebook ID photo or something. And, and the kinds of interruptions that used to only come into our lives when grandma was dying in the hospital now come to us, you know, several times a minute. And we end up in this state of, of perpetual emergency interruption, which I don't think is, is healthy neurologically or, or culturally. So um, I end up writing this book, Present Shock, which is looking at the, the notion of what, what happens when we live in an eternal present. And what I'm, what I'm exploring, this is really you know, the media theorist side of me, what I'm exploring is whether the digital media environment is genuinely asynchronous. Does it take us out of the world that we've been in for 2,000 years with beginnings, middles, and ends, with um, analog, an analog clock, with a, a, with a monetary system that is based in time, really, with money that's lent into existence and has to be paid back in interest, with interest over time, with a, a uh, corporate and, and work ethos, this uh, a time is money ethos where efficiency and increase in production are the, uh, you know, are the, the prime motivators. Are we moving into a political landscape where we no longer have ends justify the means, goal-oriented, future-based campaigns, but rather some kind of a presentist, process-oriented, consensus-building uh, uh, kind of politic, maybe more uh, uh, embodied by something like Occupy than it is by a two-party um, ideological debate. Um, and, and you know, finally, are the, um, the folks who should be helping us think about this, the uh, kind of techno theorist scientist people who should be understanding this are they 
really just taking a very 20th century, almost biblical template and superimposing it on this presentist world that we're living in. In other words, are they so um, intolerant of a world that doesn't have a defined conclusion, that doesn't have a goal, that we're not leading towards some climax, that they overlay this, this bizarre notion of a singularity through which technology is going to outpace humanity, achieve consciousness, and then leave us behind. That this, this notion of the history of the universe as information's inexorable evolution towards greater states of complexity, and information has used humanity to get to higher states, but now that computers can do it better, we can leave humans behind, and any reaction against that is some kind of a species hubris. You know, and, and I kind of, uh, in the book, I kind of pair that with the zombie apocalypse fantasy. This, this, you know, the notion that it's easier for us to imagine a zombie apocalypse than it is for us to imagine how are we going to be getting on 10 or 12 years in the future. Because it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of that difficult for us to, to look ahead. And the, that these visions, whether it's a singularity sort of Kurzweilian vision or whether it's the zombie apocalypse, they all kind of loathe humans. There's really uh, uh, the underlying theme of the zombie movies and TV shows is you know, the question of what makes us different from the zombies. You know, when the answer in these shows is nothing, finally. And if nothing makes us different from the zombies, then why should we uh, demand our place? Why shouldn't we just have our consciousness uploaded to a silicon chip? What makes humans better? Uh, so, so ultimately, Present Shock is a, a, uh, a humanist book. I'm, I'm declaring myself as on team human and deciding that this is OK. You know, because I'm a human. I mean, why not? And that that I do. And this is where I guess I would I would be more like a almost a kind of a Jaron Lanier, or or any of the other humanists out there. I I do believe that there's something special about people that we don't quite understand, and that our efforts to to uh, upload ourselves or to simulate our reality in a second life or any other kind of even a, a genomic uh, uh, human model will fall short of what it actually is that to, to, to be human. And uh, that's why what I argue is that our best defense against present shock is to be in the genuine present. That, that there's a, there are certain very good things about transcending our industrial age models, about, about transcending these kinds of stories that have been used for, I would argue, a couple of thousand years to motivate people, to get us to, to buy things, believe things, do things. Um, you know, I grew up coming to understand that the sorts of promises that were made to my father and people of his generation weren't delivered upon. The pensions, all those things didn't happen. Um, and I, and I mean, those of us who are who are kind of you know the slacker sort of uh, Beavis and Butthead, uh, Bart Simpson type people understood that the promises made by commercial culture aren't true either. Um, so coming out of that doesn't need to land us into present shock. It could land us into a, a genuinely human present, but it does uh, require us to distinguish between. Our, uh, our virtual states, our digital states, and our real ones. I think it requires us to be in real places with real people, making eye contact, establishing rapport, learning how to breathe with another person, literally conspire, breathe together, um, and, and to, to, to come to some understanding of what that sort of human local reality is, how it empowers us against the abstract entities that really depend on our, on our isolation on, and our alienation from ourselves. Um, and, and looking at that sort of that, that local human body-based um, uh, sensibility as, a, as an opening to start to understand the kinds of times that can't be measured on a calendar, can't be measured on a clock, and can't be measured by computer, the underlying human rhythms of which things like jet lag were the very beginning of people understanding that there were biological clocks that were being kind of violated by industrial technology. Well, there's other, I would argue, there's other biological and social rhythms 
that we're not taking into account when we just take corporate capitalism and try to amplify it through digital technology and make all human time generic or programmed. That there's, that there's other uh, very uh, biological and, and socially derived um, temporal landscapes that, um, that we can learn about and access, not just in, through, through new age mumbo jumbo, but you know, quite scientifically and experientially. And, uh, and it behooves us to do those before we kind of um, lose our bearings, lose our human bearings uh, in, our, in our lives and in our culture. So that's sort of the gist of what, <laughs> well, uh, so what I'm writing about. Yeah, that's a pretty rich, uh, pretty rich statement. So <laughs> um, I have a whole thing, a lot of things I want to ask you about, and, and we'll all talk with you as well, of course. Um, but it's hard to know exactly where to, where to start. Um, uh, one, one sort of, I think, easy place just for in terms of um, clarification is, so you've, I think lambasted, I think is a good word, the sing singularity folks. Um, the people, singularity, more than the folks. Oh, oh fine. <laughs> um, we can lambast them too, though. <laughs> uh, people who believe that um, growth now is so exponential technologically, and the initial idea anyway was that, that sometime in, in the near future, it's very Kurzweil stuff, that uh, we'll be able to download our bra brains into a computer and yeah. live forever or whatever. Right? So roughly there's a singularity. That's, yeah. a, that's a class of uh, one particular uh, sect on the net. Yeah. And then you contrasted that with uh, Jaron Lanier, who has um, I Am Not a Gadget and uh, many other essays and books. Um, a strong case for the human, in some sense. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but that leaves a whole lot of, of ground. So I, I suspect there are not a tremendous number of singularity supporters here. Um, I'm sure there's some, but it's, it's not like, you no. Know. Yeah. So between linear and singularity, there's a lot of tech and a lot of web. And that part of the web that's neither sort of uh, withdrawn from it in the way that Lanier hasn't, hasn't, because right. right, he's still involved. And the singularity stuff we're going to take is one extreme. Um, that broad swath of the web, um, your critique applies there as well, and you feel it also is a type of uh, very serious threat to our humanity, to our being, to our humanness, however we want to put it. Is that correct? I, I want to get the sort of the landscape of, of of I mean, uh, complaint and no, fear. I, I, the web is uh, no more a threat to our humanity than a gun is. I mean, it's, 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 you know, tech doesn't kill people. People kill people, right? So I don't, I don't, I love digital technology. I think it's a great thing. I just think we're misapplying it when we use it to, to amplify the obsolete agenda of a 13th century economic operating system, you know, which is what, what we're doing. Right? There was an emerging peer-to-peer -peer economic landscape in the 11th and 12th century in Europe through which people were developing local currencies. They were trading in, in local markets and bazaars. And we had the rise of a middle class like we've never seen in history. And the problem with this is that the feudal lords, the sort of proto-kings of that era, weren't being included in this massive creation of wealth. So they made local commerce illegal, right? They created charter monopolies, and you had to have a charter monopoly in order to have one of the big industries. So now instead of creating and exchanging value yourself, you went and you got a job. Instead of being paid for something you made, you got paid for the hours that you put in. This is a, it's a, a temporal shift, the invention of the clock, the invention of, 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 uh, of currency, uh, didn't, of that kind of currency, it didn't happen um, Coincidentally, I mean, they happened at the same time, um, which I guess is what coincidence really means. So. Um, <laughs> but not as not as uh, uh, not randomly put it that way. Um, and it it worked, right? It worked as long as you had an expanding economy, because more money had to be paid back than was lent out. So as long as you had new little regions and other little brown people and stuff to pull out of the ground and places to grow, it worked, and that stopped. You know, and it looked, I remember in the 80s, my dad, he, was in the, he was, worked in a hospital, we thought that the biotech revolution was going to save 
capitalism in the late 80s. They really thought it was going to be it. And the biotech stocks crashed. When was that, 87, 88? That crashed, and everybody thought this was really going to be the end. Then the net came around, and people thought, yay, the net. Right? And we got the dot-com boom and the long boom and all these great ideas that the net was going to allow us to have that infinite expansion. Um, but what we did was we took a technology that would have allowed us to, I think, that would have allowed us to liberate from the industrial age clock, from the, the requirement of expansion, and to adopt a different kind of, of temporal landscape and then a different kind of money and transaction that would be much more real-time based, that we, we could once again adopt currencies that were less biased towards storage and savings over time and much more biased towards transaction, towards increasing the velocity of money in real time, or have both at least, but we could have some bias towards peer-to-peer -to -peer exchange and transaction um, that we get very good things. And then because of my cell phone, I can do authentication without Bernanke and the Fed getting in the, in the middle of my transaction. I can, I can have uh, uh, currencies that don't require me or someone else to borrow money and pay it back to the bank. We can have transactions that are, that are uh, earned into existence. So no, the net is not the bad thing. Technology is not the bad thing. The, I would argue that the problem is that the people who are developing technologies are very happy to disrupt some individual industry. They're more than happy to disrupt the newspaper industry. Ooh, we got them. Or we're going to you know, disrupt the music industry. Ooh, and the, the, the book writing industry. And any, they're happy. But their first thing these kids do after they've disrupted their industry is they go to Goldman Sachs. Right? They go back to daddy and the oldest system around. And they say, oh, daddy, give me a Series B or a Series A, and let me go do that thing like you all did. Right? They're not willing to actually undermine the operating system that they're sitting on top of, right? which Facebook's sitting on, and Google's sitting on, and Twitter's sitting on. What I want these guys to do is to break that operating system, or challenge it, or actually come up with an alternative. Why do you need to go to that? Why do you need to go back to them? Why do you need to go get the corporate capital and put the clock back into businesses that weren't on the clock. So, um, um, so it's not the technology so it's not, that's doing it, because you're not a techno-determinist. It's not tech makes us do things. So right. there's something about us or our institutions that lead us to do it. And you've pointed to, I don't know what to call it, but a certain craven, uh, money-grubbing. Um, an addiction to an economic model and the inability to see that this is one economic operating system invented in the 12th and 13th century by people with a very specific agenda who have long since left the building. And the folks in the bankers and institutional uh, financiers I talk to are unaware that this is the case. They just they, they mm -hmm. haven't read. They, maybe they read a little Marx. They haven't read John Stuart Mill. They haven't read, uh, uh, they haven't read uh, um, even Adam Smith, for that matter. They really they just don't know. Um, there's a, there's a, a disconnect between basic economics and, and practical uh, uh, money creation. So, so let's take, uh, as an example, the newspaper uh, just, just as something to focus on. If it turns yeah. out it's not a good example, we can switch. Yeah. But, so I think it's, um, I'm going to give you an, an hypothesis. And you'll obviously disagree with it if you want to, which is that the new newspaper industry was killed to a large degree by Craigslist, which was not aiming at killing, did not view itself as killing the it aimed itself as a mail, it viewed itself as a mailing list, a local mailing list that would have utility if it got bigger and then it became uh, the Craigslist that we, that we know. And it was killed by Twitter, which was started primarily, the, the use case was um, some 20 year olds are trying to find each other so they can go out drinking that night and then it turned into something that has, uh, for those of us who were in Boston during the, the chase down um, uh, of, the, of the killers, uh, the marathon bombers. Um, many of us were watching CNN and had the Twitter stream, and were watching the Twitter stream be both more up to date and more accurate in correcting CNN and correcting itself too, because the Twitter stream mm -hmm. would veer all, all over the place. Twitter was not built as a newspaper killer, but it's doing something to to kill newspapers. So if granting that sort of, and if you don't want to grant it, then don't, but if that's the sort of thing that's killing newspapers, who, who should have been thinking in uh, digging down deep enough and, and recognizing that they're still adhering to old capitalist modes, old economic modes, and thinking 
deeper? I mean, where, where is that thought supposed to occur? Uh, well, I would have the users loved of the Twitter, New York Times the... to consider that before they went and bought one of the biggest buildings in New York City during the height of a real estate boom. I mean, that would have been nice. Um, I mean, when I look at the death of the book industry, the real problem with the book industry is that most publishers got bought by big media companies looking to create the illusion of growth. But they went ahead and they bought these non-growth industries. Right? The book business is not a growth industry. It's a sustainable industry. It can't work as a growth industry. So then they're going to create the illusion of growth after they bought these things by firing people. And when they fire people, they end up, what, hurting the editorial reach of the book companies. And the book companies get worse and worse and worse. So in, the, in that case, I feel like it was the, um, it's the same thing as the music industry. You know, the, the Sony and other corporations go ahead and they buy record companies right after the invention of CDs. Right after the invention of the CD, all the yuppies, not the yuppies, the, the boomers, boomer yuppies, went out and rebought their record collections. So there's this huge spike in CD sales. All the media conglomerates go, oh, look, there's a, this is a growth industry. And they go buy all those companies. Then the spike goes down. And then they're like, oh my god, our, our asset that we just bought doesn't work. And they fire all the middle people. And then the, the asset becomes less and less valuable. But the alternative model in all three of those cases, which is the web, yeah. um, you're also finding not satisfactorily disruptive of the existing economic models? I find them, I find them locally disruptive. So Pandora, which we were trying to get to work before, Pandora is locally disruptive to radio. It's locally disruptive to uh, uh, the music industry or something like that. But it's not fundamentally disruptive in that what do the Pandora people do is they're going to go to the New York Stock Exchange to try to get funded in order to, to make money for their you know, founding investors. So what, Rather than, I would prefer them to try to find a sustainable economic model for themselves rather than jumping into VC. So if, let's say Pandora jumps into VC, and let's also say, as, as is often the case, it stays basically the same, or they use the money and they expand the service, but it's still, from the end user's point of view, it's still you pay your eight bucks a month or whatever it is now, and you get their set of music, yeah. the same set of features. Why does the action of the owners of Pandora really matter to the cultural, to the, to the media, oh, to you as a media theorist? Because or, once, or to us as users? Once their primary obligation is no longer to their employees and their users, but to their shareholders or their debt structure, then the actions they take are no longer geared toward the constituency, us. Now their actions are geared towards, rather than how do I serve Douglas with this music, how do I get Douglas to pay more attention through our service to other things? How do I get him to buy his groceries through Pandora? How do I get him to do this through there so I can serve that? And that's when it's, oh, Pandora's pinging me for this. Oh, Pandora wants to, oh, hold on, I've got to get my Pandora. It's going to, OK. You know, and they're hiring the best kids out of Stanford, not Harvard, of course. They're hiring the best kids out of Stanford to figure out how to make that interface more compelling, more addictive, more dopamine releasing, you know, or endorphin releasing per minute. So, uh, so this does it express this way. It, it, the technology side of it has dropped out of your critique entirely. This is a critique no, it's of dropped capitalism. Dropped out of this conversation. Yes. Well, that's what I'm trying to get back to. So. Um, is there something about the technology? Yeah, because the, the, the ability to transcend the industrial age model is being made possible by this technology. So what should they do in order to, what would it look like to transcend it if you're Pandora? You, you don't take the VC money, you do focus on your end, well, end user term, services. You well, don't treat long, them like cattle. Long, true long term, um, Pandora would become a peer to peer music uh, sharing application. And I don't mean peer-to-peer -peer sharing of Sony music. I mean peer-to-peer -peer sharing of music that, that we make, that we would create a different kind of social marketplace for music. And music would slowly, not to get new age on you, but music would slowly begin to retrieve some of its sacred value as opposed to its, its monetary value. And why is it OK that it's retrieving its sacred value? Because it turns out we don't really need everybody making money, because we don't really need to get to full employment, because we don't all really need jobs, because we have more than enough stuff really already, and we could probably have 10, 15% of us working at the kinds of jobs that are required. I mean, the, 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 it really goes back to another economic argument, which is that jobs is not the problem. 
Right? We don't really all need jobs or want jobs. I don't want a job. I want stuff. I don't want a job. And is there stuff out there? There's a lot of stuff out there. I would like meaning. I would like to make a meaningful contribution to my society. But what is a job? Job's another artifact of the industrial age. You know, a job is, is from a time when, not that we've decided it was more efficient, but that we could extract more value from people if they were working by the hour for a company than if they were creating value and exchanging it. So can I ask you a, yeah. quick, a quick question, um, which I sort of know the answer to because we've talked about What is your next book about? Economics. Uh. <laughs> I want to look at what are the possibilities for a digital economy. Can we get there? Can we have one? I mean, but the real thing, I mean, in present job, what I'm looking at in terms of technology, what I'm looking at is the difference in, and it's what McLuhan would call media environments created by different technologies. Right? So we get way back when we have the invention of text. The invention of text is what put us in time to begin with. Before text, there was just things spinning around in day and night and seasons and cold and warm and get to warm places, get away from cold, plant some stuff, see if it grows. We got text, what did we get? We got accountability. Now I could write down what happened yesterday, and I can write down what I intend for tomorrow. With text, we got a religion that was based on accountability. It was a covenant, a contract with God. If we do this, you will do that. With text, we get Moshiach, right? We get Messiah. We get the future, right? So with text, we get the calendar. We get a past. We get a future. We get progress. We get goals. We get laws. We get Sabbath. With the clock, we get the industrial age, we get, we get efficiency, we get a day that's now broken up into little pieces. But that's what an hour is, is the segment of the day. And we got interest-bearing currency, and we got the idea of trying to do more in less. We got a time is money efficiency-based culture. With digital time, with a digital technology, we get a very different relationship to time. And if you think about it, look, you look at that clock there with the, the second hand that's going around, the sweep second hand that goes around. I remember I used to go to sleep watching the clock, right? and it would be 9.01, and I'd watch that, the, the second hand go around the clock slowly, and it was like 9.01, 9.01, then we're halfway through 9.01, and then we move all the way through, and we get almost to the end of 9.01, and we're almost to the 9.02, and it's a new minute, a fresh new minute, and we're here. So every minute had this sense of story, this sense of, 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 of a beginning, middle, and an end, and a goal, and a change, and a transition to something else. When my dad changed my sweep second hand alarm clock for a digital one. And it was the old kind with the flipping numbers before nice. they lit up, like a train sign. 901. <laughs> 902. Right? So each minute is no longer a journey from one minute to the other. It's a duration. It's, a, it's, a, it's an independently derived absolute duration. We're just there. It's 901. Poof. It's 9.02, poof, it's 9.03. And I would argue that media environment of living in a digital media environment where time is, is sequence, where we move instead of through time, we move from choice to choice to choice to choice. It's not worse, it's different. Right? So when we move from choice to choice to choice to choice, interruption to interruption to interruption to interruption, all of a sudden Aristotle's great linear arc no longer functions. Right? This is a world of remote controls and DVRs and asynchronous behavior, where we're not going to grind towards the eyes on the prize, ends justify the means. Where's Arnold Schwarzenegger going to take us? Will he get the gun? Will Homer Simpson get out of the power plant in time before it blows? We don't care. But right? we don't care about that. We care about what scene is being satired. What connections can we make? What, how is this going meta on that, going meta on that? And that's a, it's a, it's what I would argue is a, it's a digital sensibility. It's a, it's a very different presentist approach to, to problems where we move through media much more like a video game in real time, first person choice to choice to choice to choice. But, yeah. so that, that's beautifully said. Um, <laughs> but it's also the age of, as Stephen Johnson calls it, the 100 hour narrative, the 100 hour story. Uh, it's arguably, in fact, I, I, it, it's arguably the greatest age of television mm -hmm. ever. Um, yeah. Movies that have an arc, movies still are basically structured around an arc. You can find some movies exceptions. Movies are basically structured around but an TV, arc. But TV has gotten, gotten more yes. and more complex and, and long less and, and less, more narrative. And less and less 
three-act structure. Well, the reason why movies suck so bad is because you go in there and it's like, oh, I feel that's page 28 in Sid Feld's act structure. I can feel the gears just falling into place. Enter the hero. Oh, there's a, oh, the protagonist. You can feel it. Where you're watching Game of Thrones, what is that like? It's like a fantasy role-playing game. You're not, watching fa you're not watching Game of Thrones to see who's going to win the war. You're not watching it to get to the end. The, no spoilers. Like FR, no, it's... Spoilers. Because I am watching it to Spoil see who wins and the war. And why are there spoilers, right. interestingly enough? Why are there spoilers in modern television? Because we don't watch it at the same time. We watch right. it in an asynchronous way. I'm watching House of Cards. I'm on episode five. You're on episode... Blah, 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 blah. You know, don't... You see have ads now for Netflix where you're... They're going around holding <laughs> But I don't see... So Douglas, ear. I don't see how you can complain about... <clears throat> I'm not complaining. I'm saying how, the way it is. Okay. I don't, see, I don't see how you can point that out. Yeah. And at the same time, say that we don't care about narrative. I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying that there's, there's a kind more narrative, of narrative than ever. I'm not. This is the thing I'm saying. This is the thing that's not working anymore. Create a character. Put that character through a series of trials. Enter the hero in the hero's journey until he gets to the point where we can't take it anymore. And he makes his decision. And then he has his crisis and his climax and his recognition and. And, and denouement, that sort of crisis, climax, sleep, male orgasm curve of Western narrative is giving way to a different kind of narrative, which is maybe just as long. I mean, what would Game of Thrones look like? Oh, if you, were, geez. you can't do that, right? It's going to be here. Oh, and then there's this parallel track here, and then there's those ones, and these creatures that come over, over here as we move through. I right? said no spoilers. Uh, oh, right. my god. <laughs> you know, so there. And yeah, this is great, and this can go on and on and on. What we're talking about, it's, you know, our experience of excitement doesn't go away. It just shifts from a one-pointed get to the goal, who wins, who loses. There's sinners and the, and the, and the winners, the, the vanquished and the conquistadors, all of those great, since Aristotle, industrial age sort of models <coughs> of winners and losers shifts to a fantasy role-playing game-like storytelling which is just as narrative, right? It's just as continuous, but it's no longer just groping towards one big bang. So why, so why is that, I don't want to say the word bad. You seem very exercised about this. Why is this bad? Uh, why would it be bad? Uh, why would it be? Because this, it's, I think it's, good it's more complex and complicated. And I just and want to tie it, it back to time on, for a it moment. It doesn't depend on single heroes. I mean, the. The, what's bad about it is it's very hard to rally a people, especially an uneducated people or a stupid people. It's hard to rally them if you don't have a single charismatic leader to follow and a, and a single goal and all that. It's, it's hard for people, right? They look at something like <laughs> Occupy and say, what the fuck are these kids doing, <laughs> right? That's what, they, that's what they do, but it's, it's more complex. So shouldn't we look at Here's an alter alternative reading, okay? Same phenomena. I actually want to put Game of Thrones in a box because it, I, I agree it is structured more like a video game. But look at the other 100-hour narratives. The, this is where the, uh, this is what sh is shaping the, our popular culture to some extent, starting with The Sopranos and, and moving on. Is, and even a show like Friends. Sopranos is so extraordinarily presentist, right? How did that end? <laughs> Cut to black. Existential, no end. We will not give you that ending because what were they saying? They were saying this. We're not going to give you, life doesn't work like that. And if it does end in a big thing, you're not even going to know it because you're going to be dead. Right? Boof. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. It was, that, was a, that was a show where he refused to give it. Lost is the one they tried to give it and then everyone got mad. Right? Because Lost is what? Lost is presentist narrative. It worked more like the video game Mist where you're on this island and you're just trying to figure out the puzzle and draw connections between different things. You're uncovering the reality rather than moving through a singular narrative. So would you, would you uh, um, agree, disagree, or something else, um, with, with the uh, notion that part of what is driving presentism is a recognition that the future is way more complex and, and emergent, uh, something that you write at some length about, in the book, that it is, in fact, way less predictable than we had thought. And this is, you know, whether you go to the black swan world or to the Wolfram world, um, that it is so uh, dependent upon starting conditions and small changes and the complex relations mm. that the future has become much 
Uh, you know the ancient Greeks um, thought of the future as being behind us, hmm. which is really weird because it's yeah. not how we view it. We have this arc idea. I mean, what you just drew right. is not, right, for the Greeks, the, it was behind right. us because that's the one thing you can't see. You can see the present, you can right. see the past. Future, really don't know when the turtle's gonna drop uh -huh. on your head out of the sky and kill you. Um, one of the Greek playwrights that happened to, apparently. So is, is presentism simply a reflection of a growing recognition of, our, of how complex and, and losing the illusion that we can actually predict the future? And so what we're left with is... Yeah, and on top of that is a, a decrease in our fetishization of the future. You know, the 90s, particularly because of the way the numbers were, and the end of a millennium, we were all leaning into the future. You know, what's going to happen? We had our dot-com boom and our long boom and our millennium bug and our harmonic convergence and our 2012 and just all of these bizarre, bizarre things that were going to happen. And I feel like we got to the year 2000, and then all of a sudden we were there. You know, it was February, March, to 20, in the year 2000, the market crashed. People were like, well, I don't really care what pets.com is going to be worth someday according to this business plan. I want to know what's it worth now. So I feel like the, the shift to presentism had a lot to do with yeah, in some ways realizing that the future is unknowable, but also the future is the place where we get fooled. The future is the place that because we can't know it, people screw with us there. You know, it's where, it's where all of those life insurance policies can get all, you know, can get all sketchy on you. Right, oh, well, this end has annualized interest of blah, 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 it's all going to be that or do you work you know you work hard now and you know you, when your when your pension doesn't happen and you see other people's pension funds dissolving all of a sudden the future becomes much less of a, 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 a motivational <laughs> but yeah I mean and it goes along you know the death of the future also goes with the death of the past though you know I feel like people are growing less tolerant of the big bang as you know oh well if we give you the big bang then all your physics works out it's kind of like well no actually that doesn't, it, it's, it's, I feel like we're, we're, we're less, uh, we're less willing to just give me that one, you know. Okay, so we've gone to, from the Big Bang to the singularity, the end of time, of course, and, and Moshiach, as they just showed this. up. Which just yeah, right? just there. It's just trying to put that <laughs> over that, right? And this doesn't work over that. It ends up much more fractal, right? It turns out we don't have to have an end of reality. I think some people are... Yeah, yeah, that's why I was trying to move towards... Yes, sir. So, you know, I'm curious if this is really a new problem. You know, I mean, presumably there are a bunch the of... The web wants a microphone, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I'm curious if this is a new problem. I mean, you know, so 2,500 years ago in the, in, you know, Asian subcontinent, people, people sat beneath a tree, they meditated, they developed Buddhism, which is sort of an entire system for dealing with present shock to some extent you know, keeping you in the present. And, you know, so is this really that revolutionary of a change or is this something that's sort of very evolutionary and now we have the, you know, is, has this problem been around forever, essentially? The problem has been around forever, but the uh, uh, form of distraction from the present changes, right? So, yeah, the Greeks talked about Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is time of the clock. Kairos is human timing, right? Kronos is I crashed the car at 4.02. Kairos says, what time do I tell dad I crashed the car? 407? No, it's after he's had his drink, before he's opened the bills. It's much more about, about timing. So yeah, text took us out of Kairos and into the calendar. The clock took us out of Kairos and into efficiency and contracts and, and money. And digital technology takes us out of Kairos and into the interrupted tweet and update. So in, and in each of these cases, yeah, the answer is the same. It's to fall back into the present and to, to, be, to, be, to be here now, if, you know, if you want to get Ram Dass about it. But the, the trick to being here now in an industrial era is different than the trick to being here now in a digital era. And I feel like the, the obstacles and, and distractions from that now are different. You know, so the, as, a, as a culture, we are living in a digital so sequence Do we landscape. need a new spiritual practice to figure this out, essentially? Do we need some new spiritual practice for this new age of, of distraction and present shock or something? 
Well, I don't know. I, I, I hate to, to ghettoize the spiritual in the spiritual. You know what I mean? Because then it makes it as if it's like, oh, this thing that you go to the spiritual store for. Uh, and I'm, I think that there are um, ways to reinvest in our humanity that are particular to our, to our age. Yeah, I mean, and, and one of them um, is just is as simple as trying to optimize our technology for our growing sense of humanity rather than surrendering you know, what's left of our humanity to our growing sense of the technological. Why don't we uh, queue up the next person with the microphone, which it, might be him, for example. It's really interesting to hear what you have to say. I also, it sounds a little bit like you're saying that there's not a lot of, we're not using technology in a creative sense, that we're not expanding our role in creativity in the world, and uh, it seems like a lot of public money is going to fix bridges and roaches instead of doing the WPA, like, you know, where they gave it out for creativity. And short of that, where, how do you think that we can change that and use technology for to enhance creativity? I mean, some of it, it's, it's easier to get the upper middle class to do stuff than to get government to do stuff. So, I mean, some of my arguments, I think, are uh, directed to my peers in that sense. And I, I think it's as, it's as simple as, you know, we all know two kids with a laptop can create an application that changes the world. And it's just, how do you help them see that the first thing to do after they start to get some success and traction, the first thing to do may not be to sell that thing to people who are going to use it against its original purposes. I mean, and a few realize that usually they take some mistake and then they go do it, like Scott Hefferman. He does this stuff and he sells it and he goes, oh my god, that's what they do with it. Then he goes and he does meetup. And he just won't. And people are like, oh, well, it's not successful. It's like, it's successful. It depends what you mean by success. You know, it's, it's growing, but it's not growing. It's not hockey stick growth anymore. And if it's not hockey stick, then it's not going to get your Series A. Well, he's in Series B or whatever. He doesn't need it. You know, he, he's decided it's OK to have a business that supports its, its employees and its users. You know, whether or not the landscape can tolerate that is sort of what we're going to see. I think it can. Hello, my name is Greg Beyer, and um, I'm the director of sustainability at the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center, which is the largest digital Tibetan library in the world, located on Harvard Square. What is your view of um, preserving cultures, particularly languages that are dying out in this age of reduced diversity? I hope people do it. Um, <laughs> you know, again, it's a matter of you know, it can be done artificially to some extent, right? But retrieved, you know, retrieved embalmed culture are not the same as cultures that have managed some form of continuity over time. You know, it's a, it's a big thing I got in with, with the Jews, of which I'm one. Um, you know, whenever we'd get into these issues of Jewish continuity, and they're like, oh, we've got to get Jews marrying Jews, and we've got to get people going to temple, and we've got to... So they equate, a lot of the institutional Jew Jews equate Jewish continuity with Jewish institutions rather than the Jewish project, or Jewish inquiry, or Jewish discussion. And so um, I, think, I think it's a matter of, of, some, of maintaining those conversations, and those conversations tend Although digital resources are great for them to happen, they tend to still happen, thankfully, in a human-to-human -human fashion. So how, the, the bigger question is, how do you um, help people to reclaim the time necessary to have human-to-human -human events? I mean, as you know, in Buddhism, you've got to sit with people. You've got to sit, or it's just not happening. You know, so it's, again, it's about, it's about you know, and I'll, I'll try to do my part in that, on the other side, saying, you know, this is not, it's not happening on your Twitter feed right now. It's not happening in your Snapchat. It's not there, you know, and hopefully there's enough, uh, uh, at least initially, shiny objects, you know, to get, to get people um, interested in pursuing, uh, you know, something that's much less immediately uh, uh, endorphin releasing. Uh. 
I was really interested in your description or your, your contrast <clears throat> between uh, sort of contemporary forms of economy and maybe pre-medieval yeah. forms of economy, sort of the that economy versus versus that one. And, um, uh, and the idea that, that there might be, I, I get you to, understood you to be saying there might be in some level a way to return to patterns similar to the previous one. Um, but I was curious because you used as your example the empowerment that comes from, and, and you picked up your phone, and, uh, and uh, I sense a little bit of attention in that you can't make a phone like that by yourself. Uh, like a, the medieval economy depended on the complexity that people produced was not extraordinarily great. You'd make a basket or you'd farm, and these are things you can do by yourself. And so I wonder how you, is there some, some hybrid or some coexistence that enables people to make baskets with those but still have somebody make those? Yeah, I think you get both. I mean, I think that the, you don't have to go back to the uh, medieval era in order to retrieve some of the mechanisms they had. I mean, I think that the, the balance might shift. But yeah, we're going to get a lot of our, at least until we all have printers, uh, 3D printers, we're going to get our industrial goods from a big, long distance, complex supply chain, global economy. And we're going to get, hopefully, you know, our food and human services and things from a thriving local economy. And so we'll have more than one kind of currency, just as you know, they used in late Middle Ages, they used the florin for their long distance transaction and because it was they were near a, a port city, they can get all the stuff. And they use local currencies for their for their local stuff. So yeah, I think we'll have well have more than one thing. I mean we might be using Square to do both. Right? You know, and swiping in the same card and who knows how that's gonna who that's gonna go. But um, no, I think we get you get more than one. Well, because if you're using if you're using a bank issued currency, then it has to be loaned into existence to come out. So it requires payback. You know, and also if you're using a centrally issued currency, then Walmart's gonna have an advantage over the local business. The only advantage a local business is gonna have over the big long distance business, because the money is more expensive for a local business, is if the local business started with with local reinvestment or local investment in itself. You know, so what I want to do, I'm trying to get to go to Chase to argue what they should do when a local business comes to them for, and this isn't even an alt currency yet, but when a local business comes to them, say they want a $100,000 loan to add bathrooms to a pizzeria, then Chase should say, look, we'll give you 50,000 of that loan if you can raise $50,000 from your community. And we're going to give you this tool to do it, which will be a, uh, you know, a, a local discount program where if someone from your town puts in $100, they'll get $120 at the pizzeria when it expands. So they get 20% back on their investment. The bank gets collateral of a sort on their loan because they can see that the town's put in 50,000. The bank's now not a purely extractive force, but is helping local reinvestment and, and sort of a, a, a local, local economic uh, velocity. I mean, all of these things, what we're looking at is the new balance between your hard drive and RAM. What I'm saying is that we've been in a hard drive society for a whole long time, right? which is all about storage. And we're moving into RAM, as individuals too. Much more present-based access to memory as opposed to just storage of, uh, and, and hoarding of stuff. So we don't lose a hard drive altogether. You don't lose central banking in a global economy, but you can balance some of the ills of long distance economic activity with uh, a, a few mechanisms to help local economic activity uh, you know, compete effectively. You know, if we are in a free market economy, we should have free market currencies as well, sort of all I'm arguing there. Um, going back to your criticism of you know, these tech companies for selling out to Wall Street and venture capitalists, to what extent is Kickstarter and sites similar to Kickstarter a good alternative that goes to the direction you want. And can I throw Bitcoin into this mix also, but certainly sure, Kickstarter first? Sure, it's really a different thing entirely. Yeah, sure. yeah. I know, I'm just taking advantage of your question. So Kickstarter, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Kickstarter is interesting, isn't it? Because now we can, you know, for certainly for anybody who's had to use 
I mean, you think of it as something like me when I write a book. It's like if I want the capital in advance to write the book, I've got to go to the capitalist to get the money. Right? And they give me the money, and then it either does well or not. And this is, you know, if I go straight to my readers through a Kickstarter, although there's, there's some problems with that, because it's obviously going to favor Radiohead and a famous writer over, you know, someone else. You know, some guy goes, who is it that got $2 million for his movie? Or, Zach Braff. Right, and he's got a zillion dollars already. It's just like, what are you doing this? Um, so there's some of that. But yeah, it's definitely, that's definitely the beginning of it. And then, what if you start to go to people, now you're not just... And there's, there's sites for this, too, where you're crowdfunding rather than you're, you're, you're crowd investing rather than just crowdfunding the particular project. It can actually get uh, more complex and interesting. But yeah, that's much more towards what? Real time. You're matching supply and demand in real time to see if you should even do the project rather than having a capitalist speculate on it a year or two in advance to see, well, will the market buy this later? And we'll do research to see if the market's going to get it. You know, it's all convoluted. As far as Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a digital style currency, but it's not what I'm talking about. You know, it's a very interesting thing, but what it is is a digital way of recreating scarcity-based centrally issued currency. You know, it's a, it's a digital model for that. And what I'm looking at would be what I'm hoping for, something much more like a let system or time dollars. You know, an actual currency that you're not trying to hoard that you're not investing in a currency, that you're using the currency merely to promote the transactions so that you can get the stuff you want and do the stuff you want. Hi, thanks, very interesting. Hey. Uh, I, not to harp too much on the Bitcoin, but I have a bit of a question about it, uh, and particularly your kind of humanism. Uh, Bitcoin, of course, is an electronic medium and all that, but it, it's extractive in that it uses a lot of electricity to generate these coins by doing calculations, whatever. I'm curious about the humanism that you're kind of talking about. It seems that maybe that kind of humanism is part of the problem in that you have kind of active human subjects that are encountering these kind of dead or non-living inanimate objects that then can be used. And I'm kind of curious about, do you think that the kind of presentism that you're talking about is contributing to that or that there's a way out? Uh, in the future, or if you're even allowed to think about the future, is there a way out? Well, I mean, there's two. I don't want to conflate present shock with presentism, right? Or present shock is sort of our initial wobble at moving from a a kind of a linear time-based society into this digital choice-based, highly interruptive one. You know, there's this initial human reaction of ah uh, and panic, and that's really what the book looks at is the five kinds of panic that we have. Um, where presentism is really the ability to kind of now embrace and survive and, and reclaim our humanity on this, on this landscape. I mean, uh, generally, I, I, don't, I don't see the way that, that almost any technologies help us reclaim our humanity, except insofar as they create time for us to be with other people. You know, that, there's, that, that, it is the, that it's the it's the face-to-face, real-time human interaction. And the more you do that, I mean, and this starts to get, you know, out there or futurist, I mean, the more you get there, the more, the, the less money even needs to be a part of the equation. You know, the more comfortable you are with other people, the more, you know, and I always tell the story, when we were in Park Slope, the old lady down the hall offered to teach my wife how to breastfeed the baby. You know, but you just don't do that. You hire a lactation consultant. Who is this lady? You know, and she's going to, if we, if, if we take that favor from her, what do we owe her? We don't know. Is she going to want to come in and sing Christmas carols and show tunes and who knows? You know, and then, and then we end up, you know, actually denying ourselves the, the social cohesion that we get through mutual dependency. You know, so I, I feel like we can, um, that we can, we can re-engage with some of that um, as we feel safer, you know, safer with each other. And that the monies, for the most part, the monies we have now don't allow that. I mean, they're not supposed to. They're, they're, they're part of a system through which we've been taught not to trust each other, not to transact. We've been taught that money is a cleaner way to <laughs> engage with each other and all that. And slowly, hopefully, we'll you know, start to trust each other more than the stuff.
<clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Jed Schwartz, a uh, writer. Um, uh, I had a question which was, uh, uh, this presentism or uh, uh, it conceals what, in your view? That, that is to say, what, what are the characteristic things that we should be thinking about that we aren't thinking about because we're co so constantly distracted? And I'd like to suggest an answer, which you might agree with or not, and, and that answer is uh, class, differentiated class, social class interests, hmm. which tend to be verboten. Uh, 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 Forbidden, uh, a, forbi a verboten topic, a, a forbidden topic. That is, to, to suggest that somebody might be working class in the media, to introduce somebody in the media as a working class person, would be uh, not, not, not something these characters have not done because it would be considered to be an insult to the person. Uh, uh, and, and I would just like to uh, mention one other thing, and that is, I was re recently reading a sociologist named Karl Mannheim, who's very, I mean, whose, whose work is from the early part of the 20th century, uh, who suggests that the, the characteristic state in which class interests are fudged and smudged out and, and, and uh, 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 distorted and uh, is, is characteristic not of uh, communism or socialism, but of fascism. Uh, and that one of our major fears is of being, of appearing to be a communist. Very few people are afraid of being denounced as fascist. Uh, I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the way it is, as far as I can see. And, uh, and I don't know whether I've said too much or should turn the microphone over to somebody else. Well, let's what? get a response. Yeah, sure. I'm working on a graphic novel about a fictional occult war between Aleister Crowley and Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and in the, the, in the story, Crowley basically wins, right, but applies his magic to, basically teaches it to someone who creates the American advertising industry, which it's slowly revealed as, as the sort of the master plan uh, uh, is that it's going to migrate into cyberspace, into social media, where it can finally have a body, right? And then it finally has, it's, not, it's no longer abstract, but now it's a thing. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> but, uh... And the arc of that is more or less just like, Weep. Like no, it's more woo wah. <laughs> wah. <laughs> it's more the it's more the, the I'm more into Shakespeare's kind of meta theater, you know, where he'll be like, you know, they'll they'll be on stage watching a play and they'll say, I wonder if someone's watching us now. You know, they they do that in Shakespeare a few times. I wonder if someone's watching us. He's sort of looking over their shoulder. That's, that's sort of my, my preferred. It's the Beavis and Butthead style of uh, narrative arc, where you just open it up to the next one or to the next one or the next one. There was actually an occult war between Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Steiner, which yeah. you may know. Um, <clears throat> in, a thought about um, meta, 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 meta. Maybe one way to think about that is in terms of resonance and overtones, because when you when you make a note in music, it has all of its overtones in it. Everything is present all at the same time. A lot of what I'm hearing from you, it reminds me of situationists mm -hmm. and situationism. And I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about whether that has actually been an influence on what your what your thinking is. I mean, more so overtones than situationists in terms of. Uh, uh, and, and the notion of, I mean, this, this here would be more like a soloist in a Western opera, and this would be more like a gamelan. So this is more listening, and that's more shouting. This is more a subject that's more uh, landscape. You know? And I talk a little bit about how to do lateral thinking, that lateral thinking is, the, is kind of the required form of pattern recognition in a presentist 
universe, because we no longer have a linear story to understand things. We can't go, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. We've got to make sense by looking. And the way you make sense by looking is by kind of softening your gaze and seeing the patterns, but not drawing too many patterns or you become a paranoid, you know, drawing direct lines between things. So how do you, you know, how do you uh, uh, balance that is sort of the, uh, the trick. There's a chapter in there called Fractal Noia, which is about that, that when you see too many patterns, you get the, you get the noia rather than the, the sort of the, the reassuring self-similarity, you know, of the fractal. In fact, so I'm actually glad that you talked a little bit about fractal. I want to ask you about a question that is only somewhat related, if you don't mind. Uh, actually, if you don't mind. Um, you, at, at one point, um, I don't know, uh, argue, uh, warn against links because they're drawing too many connections and they're too flat. And since that seems exactly, I, I see it exactly the opposite. I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about why the, as I would say, the enriching of the word, it, enriching of the world through these many, many collections is in fact makes you nervous or hesitant. Well, it doesn't. It's just a balance. We're moving into a world where everything's linked to everything else. Right? Once everything's linked to everything, then there might as well be no links between anything. Right? Then you've reached total entropy again. Right? Because then there's no, what's if everything's linked to everything else and the link has no meaning? Um, but if you have the ability to link anything to anything else, um, then yeah, just use them, use them wisely, use them selectively. You know, it's just a matter of creating balance between the, the sense of infinite connection and, and sense of holism. It's much, just the same problem that you can experience on any level. If you're part of a group, do you over, if you over-identify with the group, you lose yourself. If you over-identify with yourself, you lose the group. So it's just how do, you, um, how do you strike a balance? And just understanding that this is something that, uh, that's required of us now, if we're going to remain coherent in, in a presentist-linked society. Um. Europe. Um, I mean, so you talk about uh, humanism, and obviously part of that is, you know, being human, you're going to die, right? So we have this limited lifespan, and, uh, you know, lot, plenty of literary theory. We like this narrative arc because it mimics our life, right? We try to get as high as we possibly can yeah. before we spiral down and die. So, you know, how do you think that contributes to the anxiety of this presentism that sort of doesn't allow us to envision this future for ourselves? I mean, it does. It's, it's the, we reach the peak of that, of this individual arc, in an individual consumerist society. Right? The individual was kind of invented in the Renaissance, and it peaked with McDonald's. You, you're the one. Right? <laughs> it was. I mean, we didn't think of ours. We didn't have the individual journey as, as, as such, the way we understand it now. And the reason we have a highly individualized society is because the more, in, more individualized we are, the more stuff we buy. Right, you, you, we have every family on my block has its own snowblower, <laughs> which is insane, right? But it's good for the economy, right? If we didn't each buy our own snowblower, then someone at the snowblower company is going to be out of work and looking for a job. And that's, that's the others, that's back to the other thing. So we all got to buy our snowblowers. Um, but right, so we reach that sort of peak of individuality. At the same time, we can't lose our individuality totally, and we shouldn't because that's. That's where, we're, that's where we're at. That's how we experience the world. It's just that this arc, the anxiety of this arc, is exacerbated, I would argue, by things like um, Gordon Bell, one My Life Bits project, where you go to Microsoft and you have everything you've ever done, everything you've written, every poop you've made. He's wearing a camera all day. Yeah, everything is recorded. And you end up with this great, completely linear timeline of everything you've ever done that's a map that's as big as the territory of the timeline that you've just walked through, you know, which is nuts. I mean, it's going to drive you crazy. As opposed to something, and I talk about it in here, something like the brain, which is a way of recording things that are of interest to you by drawing connections between... Software called the brain. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Jerry it's Mikowski. A piece of software. Jerry Mikowski uses it a lot, and he's sort of the biggest user, I guess, of it. It's kind of like a World Wide Web of all the stuff you see, and you draw connections, and every time you go back to it, you see a different history. It's much more like real life, where every time you look back on your life, it looks different, that your history kind of changes with your perspective of it. So there's different ways to, to record and accumulate who you are. Right? And some of them are more fluid and, and up for interpretation than others. 
Um, many elementary and secondary students in America go to school in a system that's rooted firmly in the industrial age in both its goals and methodology. Um, what needs to happen in your view to prepare students going through school systems now for present shock and dealing with some of these issues that you're talking about? I mean, two things. One is um, I do think they should learn code. Right? I mean, I, I advocate at Code Academy. I'm a digital literacy person. I think that if you're going to be spending an increasing amount of your time on digital platforms, you should have some basic knowledge of what they are. Program right? or be programmed. I'm going to yeah. do the plug for you. The this book is... before this one. Yeah. Um, and second, I think that real spaces need to be used for genuine live engagement. So I, I'm all for using computers to teach computers and for using them as little as possible to teach other stuff. You know, because I think that there's uh, uh, some advantage. There's so, there's so little time in a day. If you're getting people to move into a physical space together, into a room, why not try to take advantage of some of the 94% the, the of human communication that happens non-verbally and reacquaint people with that before uh, you know, we all have a kind of a functional Asperger's so uh, one more question, I think, which is going to be me. Willow. Hooray. I'm Willow Rue. I'm with the Center for Civic Media out of the Media Lab. And I see the um, self-documentation and desire to categorize and link as a way of building predictability into this that mm. we've only gotten out of Quest for the Upper Right Quadrant. And I like that you talked a little bit about how to get existing structures like Chase to start supporting... Uh, more localized and focused on on the chaos, mm. but there's still a distinct lack of predictability. As in, I know where my next paycheck is coming while I exist in this system, right. while building a new one. Um, are there are there any other ways besides persuading the current infrastructure to allow space for this? Yeah, take the space, right? <laughs> um, no, we do. You know, occupy. Um, in one way or another, whether it's you know uh, uh, community supported agriculture, local babysitting clubs, um, uh, educational co-ops, for where if you're stuck in a Prussian management, you know, cubberly public school nightmare, um, then um, DIY, you know, and it, I, I do think that's um, it, it's not so fanciful. I mean, you have to get your cost of living down so that you can spend more time actually you know, servicing, serving your, yourselves and one another. But it's like, the, the, for me, the, the strategy in both a doomsday scenario and a kind of a revolutionary scenario, if we call it that, are the same, right? So if doomsday is going to come, I want community-supported agriculture, I want a local support structure, I want some sort of local economic thing going on, to support me when it when it all when the when the long distance supply chain crumbles because Safeway couldn't pay its bills to Chase. Uh, at the same time, if I want to deflate Walmart and that the system that's that's oppressing us, to use a term, um, then I'm going to slowly spend more of my money and time uh, getting the stuff I need in other ways. So it's sort of that. I mean, for me, community supported agriculture was a big step. Um, because it turned out, you know, I joined a community supported agriculture group just when its fields were no longer big enough to support as many people as were signing up to do it. So they needed to get a new field. We buy a new field, and then we find out that the field was, was mandated for corn-only use by a corn lobby. So then we got to find out how the state legislature works and to get this thing changed. It turns out, so we fight this whole thing. It turns out it wasn't actually, it, it was a lie. <laughs> that it, but... That's just as a lie, a, a lie law is just as pertinent as a real law. But, um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But it just teaches you, oh, there is this. And, and you've worked with legislature people before. I mean, that's kind of where I learned. There are these people there in government that kind of are, want people to come to them with real problems. They're just sort of sitting there. Like there's the ones on top who are arguing about abortion or whatever kind of abstract, you know, to them, abstract issue that's not going to get happening, you know, or change. But then there's all these real ones who are just like, oh, you have a problem. We can actually work with you. And it sort of, it, re, it, it does re, fills you with a little bit of faith that as long as you stay out of the tops of government, you can get little things done. 
I think a little bit of faith is actually a really good place for us to end up. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, thank you thanks so, much, so much. Thanks so much for coming. Well, we were all over the map, but I think that's all right. No, it was right? We're allowed. Yeah. It's Harvard. <laughs>